Please take your seats. We're about to get started. My name is Charles Gao. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our career panel. We have five excellent guests here. And I'd like to introduce them one by one. First, to my right, we have Scott Pioli, Assistant General Manager of the Atlanta Falcons. And to his right, we have Noel Nash, VP Stats and Information at ESPN. And then to his right, we have Greg Corbos, Senior Product Manager at Reebok. And then to, to his right, we have Allison Katz Mayfield, Manager of Strat Strategy Analytics at the NFL. And this, this panel will be moderated by, Me by Megan Morgan, CEO of M Squared Research and Consulting. So this panel will last 45 minutes, including questions and answers. And please use the hashtag um, game plan to send in your questions, and I'll make sure that they get to the, the coordinator. So without further ado, let's hand it over to Megan. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the uh, Sunrise panel on this Saturday morning. Um, without further ado, I'm going to ask our panelists to give you the quick Cliff Notes version of their path to how they got to where they are today in their careers in sports. And I'm going to start with you, Allison. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I took probably a relatively non-traditional path mm -hmm. out of undergrad. I did economic and financial litigation consulting uh, for a company called Analysis Group. Um, it was an area where I was able to really hone my kind of quantitative and analytical skills. And after that, I went to MIT Sloan where I was uh, the president of the Entertainment Media and Sports Group and a head organizer for this fair conference. Um, and then actually through the conference, I got a job with StubHub doing pricing analytics out in San Francisco. And about a year and a half after that, I, uh, using my network, got connected to the NFL and our club business development group, which is kind of like an internal consulting group for the 32 clubs, um, and I'm there now as manager of strategy and analytics. So my follow-up, and it'll be similar for you, all of you, is your expectation when you decided that you wanted to be in sport, your expectation of what your first job would be or how you would get your first job versus what it really was, how, how did that match up? Um, it can be a humbling experience for sure. Um, I personally, you know, I think like a lot of people had the idea that I was going to just kind of come in and uh, hit the ground running and run things. Um, and it was a little bit different than that. You know, I had to really prove myself, especially coming to the NFL. Um, I had to come in and take a position that, you know, maybe in my head I was overqualified for just from the job description, um, and really prove myself and do any and everything that was asked of me. And it was a little bit of a shock to the system. Um, well worth every late night and early morning. But I think you've got to be prepared to do more than on the job description and maybe take a step back, if, especially coming from consulting, take a step back from the career path I'd been on. Now, Greg here is also an alumni of this conference. He was a co-lead, I believe, back in the day. So tell us about how you got to where you are at Reebok. Sure. So I was an electrical engineer for undergrad, and then I wrote co uh, code for the Department of Defense. Came to MIT, ran this conference, uh, uh, worked for free, uh, unpaid internship. I got course credit for the last semester while I was here. Uh, when I graduated, there was a spot that opened up in the group I was working at at Reebok and uh, slid in, right time, right place. I was in the basketball group. Um, I think when you're talking about how did, it, how did it play out, was it your expectations? I was doing jump tone shoes, so it was really exciting. Um, it, it was not what I wanted it to be, but you quickly kind of learn that you have to pay your dues, you have to put in your work, like you said, uh, stay humble and hungry, and ended up doing the John Wall product, ended up moving on and on, and here I am. Well done. Yeah. Noel, tell us about uh, ESPN. Sure. I, uh, I spent about 25 years in daily newspapers before I arrived at ESPN nearly 10 years ago. Uh, started off at my hometown newspaper in Miami, Florida, 
Um, very humbling experience to be in a newspaper newsroom uh, at times. I started at the very bottom uh, and did just about everything, but I was passionate. That's what I wanted to be. I didn't necessarily want to work in sports. I wanted to be a newspaper person. Uh, and so I took every job that I possibly could, every, every grunt job. I would cover events that nobody else wanted to go report at, uh, whatever I could do to grow my career and get more experience in and out of the newsroom. Um, I was at the Dallas Morning News when ESPN decided to create the stats, uh, a stats department that was sort of of, by, and for ESPN, uh, for all the clock, score, and statistics that power the different platforms. And uh, so came to ESPN really as part of a startup within the company. And of course the Stats and Information Group, uh, which sort of sits at the intersection of technology and data and storytelling, uh, has just continued to grow over those 10 years here. Uh, sort of like this conference. So it's, it's been great. Awesome. Scott, welcome. Well, uh, just background, I uh, went to school at Central Connecticut, got my master's from Syracuse in, uh-oh, uh all right. We, uh, uh, Connecticut's not that bad. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it was the Central Connecticut part, is what that threw. Um, and then went to Syracuse University, got my master's in television and film, uh, totally unrelated to anything that I was going to do. Uh, when I got out, I knew that I wanted, I thought that I, my entire life, that I wanted to be a football coach, so I got into coaching, was a graduate assistant coach at Syracuse. I uh, was in coaching for four years, and then made the transition from college to the NFL, and we talk about paths, you know, the important, one of the critical junctures of my career was at 27 years old. I left a full-time job at a 1AA school coaching to take this amorphous, position that Bill Belichick had created in Cleveland that was, uh, you know, a little bit, you do whatever you can. And uh, that was this, my start in the NFL, and to a similar story, at the time, this was 1992, yeah, 92, and I was, uh, took the job for a significant pay cut for, to make $14,000 a year, which at 27 years old, moving into government subsidized housing was, was, was an interesting kind of uh, uh, venture, but the truth was I was so passionate and excited about the job and to be doing what I love to do for literally 16 to 18 hours a day I was in the office, so going back to the apartment with the roaches really didn't matter so much, and uh, there was three meals a day in the office and didn't get much better than that, and then from that time I've now spent uh, 24 years in the NFL, again on a path that I had no idea, you asked what, what was the the expectation when I got into football, I had no, um, I had no plan or desire to be. I shouldn't say desire. I had no plan or thought that the goal was to be a general manager. All I wanted to do was be better each day and make the people around me better each day and stay in something that I loved. So, when I look around this this room, I see a lot of um, you know fairly young faces who are probably you know at the cusp of a job search process, and certainly for that next job that is going to be the, the big one. Um, so what do you think, uh, we, we, we've had some conversations heading into this panel. Um, Greg, what do you think the, big, the biggest thing, piece of advice that they need to do to prepare to embark on that is? To prepare. Um, I mean, you got to do your homework, right? You got to know what you're jumping into. Um, I think expectations, realistic expectations up front. Um, if you're getting hired, you're most likely getting hired at the bottom. You're making, what, 30K? It's not going to be fun. Uh, you're going to work long hours. Um, 30. But you, 30? 30 is high? Great start. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's the expectations, right? I think everybody, you may go to a fancy school where you're dad may be this person or you may have this connection. None of that matters. Uh, you get in where you can get in. You do your work. You do your job, right? Um, humble, hungry, and you just have to bust your ass. And it's no job is too small, no job is too big. And you do it with a smile on your face. And then that's how you get the respect. That's how you kind of get your reputation. That's where the people above you kind of look at you like, OK, this, this kid's for real. Awesome. That provides integrity to the process, right? Uh, we get a lot of referrals from senior executives at ESPN who we <laughs> don't hire, and that's okay. 
It's not about who you know or who you were referred by. It really is about coming in and proving your mettle uh, on your own. No, that brings up an interesting thing. Allison, um, the gift of the, the informational interview, um, when you have the opportunity to speak to someone in the informational, and understand that that is a gift. When someone agrees to give you their time to sit with you and talk about whether it's their path or what kind of advice or to give you perspective on the industry, that's a gift. And, and accept it and be gracious and treat it the right way. When you went through those and you had the, those opportunities, what did you gain most from that and what advice, how can you give these people the advice to make the most of those gifts? So when I was looking to transition out of StubHub, um, I started tapping into my network and set up lots of informational interviews. I think first and foremost, those are informational. I was not you know, applying to a job there, I was not asking for a job. I was trying to learn more about the different positions that were out there and what would be of most interest to me. So I think it's making sure, and it goes back to doing your homework, making sure you know what the person you're interviewing with and informationally interviewing with does, and then also just taking it all in and not taking up much time. You can get a lot out of a 15, 20 minute inter informational interview. Um, but I went through, I was, you know, I sent thank you notes afterwards, it's those kind of things, but it's just making sure that I knew when I was ready to apply to jobs, what I wanted to do in sports, what types of roles were out there that would be of most interest, and that was what I was able to gain from these informational interviews. And you also start to broaden your network and start to meet people, and then, if you do a great job in an informational interview and you're engaged and you have interesting things to say about their business as well, when they're ready to hire someone, that resume that you, you know, gave them just to give them background on you might come back up. And so I think for me it was learning more about the business and also just getting my name out there. And it was incredibly helpful for me. Now, no, when you do have a job open and you, someone finally makes it to you in the process, um, what do you need to most find out about the person in front of you? Sure. By the time somebody's talking to me, they've already passed our assessments, they've done phone screenings, they've interviewed with other managers on my team. Uh, and so when I'm talking to that person, I'm not really trying to evaluate their skills. I'm assuming they belong in front of me and they have the skills necessary to do the tasks of the job. Um, we're going to train them well, we're going to onboard them well, they're smart, so I'm not focusing on can you do the job, I'm focusing on what kind of person are they, what kind of leader uh, are they. And I'm looking for leadership competencies, can they drive results, can they think critically and strategically, do they value diversity, do they value teamwork, all of those sorts of things, will they speak up and have their voice heard. Uh, that's what's valuable to me and we like to say all the time that leadership is not a function of position or title. You can lead from any position in the organization. So that's what, that's what I'm looking for when I'm speaking to people. Scott, um, as they're going through the application process, um, what are your thoughts on them taking a shotgun approach versus being laser focused on what they're looking for? Well. It's part of what we, we discussed back, uh, backstage is one of the things that we run into now is the people that are so singularly focused on, I want to be a general manager, or I want to be, um, in, in the instance of coaches, I want to be the head coach, or I want to be a vice president of marketing or sponsorship. And then we get the other end of the spectrum, which is, I just want to be in sports. You know, I've been watching ESPN since I'm you know, five years old, and I can remember stats. and. Um, we're looking for something in the middle because if you're too singularly focused, generally speaking, the, the experiences that we've had, someone will come in and if they're so singularly focused on one thing and they don't know how to manage their own expectations and they don't know how to be a good teammate, uh, I'll digress to, mm -hmm. to, to the, the, the previous question that, that a, a piece of this is, what we're looking for, and certainly what I look for when I'm hiring, is not only people that are good leaders, because you, can, you, you want to pick that up, you can tell a lot of that in a personality, but you do need people that are followers. Essentially, big picture, what we're looking for is good teammates. And people that are good teammates know how to lead, they know how to follow, they know how to, and they know when to do each. So I think we try to find those things, and, 
and Megan, I think when we, we're looking at people that are too singularly focused or too broadly focused, we want to find something more in the middle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there are um, already some questions coming in. Hashtag SSAC, hashtag game plan um, to get them to the right place. Uh, there are some really interesting things, and I'm going to package a couple of them together because they, they work well. And they're things like, you know, uh, does your major count at all if you want to get into, into sports journalism, um, entertainment, and uh, like this one particularly for Noel, how did your foundation in journalism end up helping you transition into the more statistical field? And um, <clears throat> yeah, like so that's... Sure, sure. So our group specifically, the Stats and Information Group, nobody's graduating from college for, with a degree in the Stats and Information Group. We support studio with research, uh, you know, all the facts and tidbits that you hear the anchors and talent talking about. Uh, we do deep analytics work uh, with our analytics team. We, do, uh, we manage the data, the play-by-play -play data, and we, uh, our group also oversees the bottom lines. So, what we're looking for are people that have skill sets that are analogous to all of those things. Nobody's, again, graduating with a degree in the bottom line, but they have applicable skills, right? Uh, they appreciate attention to detail, uh, the integrity of data and the accuracy of data, being able to work in, under deadline pressure. Those are the kinds of things that we look for. So we hire a lot of journalists because those are analogous. We hire a lot of people from the business industry. We hire SIDs who have a, a, a vast sports knowledge. So we're looking for people that have skill sets that apply. And certainly in my journalism career, again, I've, I've worked under deadline pressure um, and uh, certainly had an attention to detail and integrity of, of, of text and data. Um, and newspapers, obviously, over the last 10 years, 15 years, have moved uh, increasingly into looking into, into the online area and understanding data. So it was a, a pretty natural transition for me. But uh, there's, there are folks in our group that have very disparate backgrounds and degrees. Um, even when I was still in newspapers, I would tell people, don't get a journalism degree. Uh, go get a degree in an area of expertise that you can apply to journalism. So I, uh, that's, that's what I would advocate. Greg, is it similar for you? I know that when I worked at Titles, no one had a degree in golf ball design. Is it similar for you? So it, it depends on the area. For my area specifically with product marketing, I mean, you need to obviously have a little bit of a business background, but it's just as important to understand the culture of what you're doing, the consumer. Uh, for us, um, I'm in the lifestyle group, and I've done basketball product as well. So if you have that natural understanding of the culture of the game, you can be just as impactful as somebody who went to the greatest of schools. It's, it's almost you need to have that right balance. It's easy to be smart and disconnected, and it's easy to be connected and dumb, but where's that, where's that middle ground? And that's, that's what makes you stand out. Okay. I don't know how you put connected and dumb on your resume and sell it through, but okay. Um, <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, let me, let me Maybe, see. While you're doing that, just one other Go ahead. point about the, you know, talking about the interview process. And I'm curious, in your industry or your parts of organizations, our um, entry level interview process isn't just that 15 minutes, half hour. We make it abundantly clear, and I think it's very important, and I'll just throw this to you all, that um, your first year is an interview. When you get there, your entry level position, generally speaking, is a big part of the interview. It's not just that 15 minutes, and it's not this moment when you get the job and you're like, Whew, I'm in, I'm good. I, I think it's critical to understand the things that we look for when we interview in, in organizations, when they, or, when, they, when they interview people, they'll bring you in, and there's certain things they're looking for. I, I can't find out, I can find out certain things that lead me to believe whether you're a good leader or a good follower or a good teammate um, in, in a short time. But during that time, um, seeing how someone works under pressure, right? You, can't, you can see that to a degree in an interview, but people can fool you in a short term. I would encourage you all to, to be very aware that in an entry level position, um, it's important. Uh, and I'll just speak, uh, there's someone here in the audience right now who knows this very well, is working with us at the Atlanta Falcons, John. You, you've, you know, John came in, we did a great job in the interview. 
he has since, where we actually left the interview, well, we're not sure if, if he's this or, 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 or he's that. In this time, he has done such a, such a good job of showing us that he's so much more capable of some of the things where we had question marks. And again, I, I don't know if that's yeah. oh, it's a fair in your... Yeah, you're, I don't you're, think it's just entry level. I think, you know, wherever you're coming in, you're proving that you can add something to the organization, whether that's working well under pressure or leadership or coming up with a new idea, right? You have your job description, you have your day-to-day -day work that you're going to be doing, but what new different thing can you bring to the organization to grow it, drive revenue, whatever the goal is? How can you add something unique that will make you stand out from all the other people that are now trying to get a job and also all the other people that you work with. There's, there's too many people that want to be in the industry to do the bare minimum. Conversely, Basically. I was just gonna say, conversely, we've all seen instances where they've hired from the outside instead of promoting from within because the internal candidate hasn't gone the extra mile and so, hasn't, haven't we? Great point. Um, Getting the job is not the end of the interview. You're, you're, you're interviewing every single day in your career. The way that you show up, the way that you approach your work, uh, all of that. It, yeah. Allison, there's a, a, a couple of questions here about um, how important is the alumni network, how valuable is it, and then um, what specific, uh, where, where is it? There was another one about, oh yeah, and talk more about what entry level jobs for MBA students from top schools, what positions do they get? And I think that, that those two things are kind of... The alumni network parallel. is incredibly important. Um, the sports industry is a small and very connected world. And I mean, I got my job at the NFL. I reached out to a lot of different people I met at Sloan, before Sloan, at the conference itself. Um, that's when I was taking those informational interviews and also just letting those people know, hey, you know, I'm starting to look for different jobs. And I reached out to Jessica Gelman, who I had known from the conference, and I let her know that I was starting to look, just got some advice from her, and then, you know, a month and a half later, she's like, hey, someone just reached out to me uh, from the NFL, and I think it's a position that would be great for you. So I don't have my job now if I hadn't used my network. Um, I mean, in terms of the type of positions that are out there, it's incredibly varied, and that goes back to knowing what you want to do. Um, I didn't necessarily know I want to work in the National Football League. I mean, I love football. I'm from Boston. You know, I've grown up watching the Patriots, and it's been a great fit, but I knew that I wanted to do something in strategy and analytics. I had some pricing background that I really enjoyed, and that's something I did at StubHub as well. Um, so I was looking for that type of position within sports. Um, but there's, I mean, it's, it's such a varied world. You just have to know what you're looking for because there's, there's so many positions out there and so few openings. Yeah, so the follow-up to that is, and I'm going to just throw this out. You choose who to answer it. Can we talk more about the informational interviews? What's the best way to set them up? Ask for coffee over LinkedIn? What's the best way? Um, usually I get an email, and I'm... I'll, I'll regret this because you'll all send me emails now, right? But, um, but I'm, I'm usually pretty friendly and open and, and willing to talk to people. I'm always, I was in your seat six years ago, so I know the hustle, and I respect that, right? So it's, it's more, what do you want to get out of it? I think there's too many people that, that email you, and then it's like, so how do I get a job? And it's, that's, that's not what it's about. If you want to get the information, like you were saying, to understand the roles and then kind of figure out what you want to do, then, then use it for that. Um, but it's not reach out, give me a job. Nobody here is going to say, hey, does anybody want a job? Like, I'm giving out jobs. There's not, there's not that. Mm -hmm. So. And I think there's a, it's a very delicate balance between being ambitious and aggressive in trying to seek a person out and to the, the other side where you're saying, don't just throw something out there without follow-up. But there's also a very delicate balance and don't go too far in being overly ambitious or in touch too often too much in the stalker sense. That, that can get awkward. <laughs> I think it goes back to the very beginning about being targeted. Don't just try to contact somebody and say, hey, I want a job at ESPN. You want to ask very specific questions when you reach out to folks. And I would encourage people to try everything. Uh, you know, uh, we're on LinkedIn. We have public-facing email addresses. Again, don't 
get to stalker level, but uh, certainly reaching out to people to ask questions and ask informed questions. Do, again, do your homework before you, you contact folks. It's not expecting too much time from anyone, right? I think all of us probably have 15 minutes out of our day once in a while where we can do it. If you're trying to you know, set up 45 minutes an hour, people, no one has that kind of time. So I think it's, again, it goes back to being targeted and stuff, but it's also just being mindful of everyone's time. It's, hey, can I grab 15 minutes? Maybe that turns into 30 if it's a great conversation. But you can glean a lot of information just from talking to someone in the industry for 15, 20 minutes. And, I, and I'll say that one of the things that I feel worse, the worst about my job is when I don't have the 15 minutes to help someone and mentor someone because you know it's, all of us at some point either have a mentor or someone who helps open a door, at least open a gate. And it's, it's a tough thing because I think anyone who's been down this path has a passion to help, but finding that right balance, uh, again, that's one of the toughest parts of my day is having to say that I've only got time to respond to these 10 letters or these emails, and it's, uh, it does become difficult, so please be patient. Hmm. Yeah. This one's a very specific question, Mr. Pioli. How important is analytics knowledge when hiring a scout or a scouting intern? I think um, there's different types of, of scouts and entry-level scouts that we want to hire. Um, again, because of my background, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think my history makes me feel, and a lot of the people that I've seen become truly successful, is that they have a football background. And that football background um, can come from playing, or the, the, the reality is there's people who haven't been able to play for whatever reason. Um, again, it's someone who didn't want to play. And it's, it's been a very interesting discussion that we've had in terms of gender diversity and gender hiring. Um, I still believe that being very close to the game in any way that you can, if you're at a school and you can't play or you're not going to play, being around the football program and learning football from the bottom up, whether it's as a student manager, whether it's as a student assistant, every college that has a major program, and even some that don't have major programs, um, have jobs available within their football department. And specifically, some of the smaller schools have more jobs available because they don't have the funding for full-time coaches. They're looking for people to do anything within their program. So I think in terms of scouting and any football operations job, um, there's, there are ways to show, to not only educate yourself, yourself, but to show people moving forward how passionate you are about the game. Um, for instance, when I hear someone say, well, listen, I wasn't a good enough player to play at College X, or um, in the case of uh, some young ladies that I've hired, well, listen, I'm a woman, so I couldn't play football, but I was able to be a student manager, or I, I chose to be um, one of the coach's assistants and do analytics for the coaching staff or help on recruiting weekends. Those people who chose to be close enough to the game and truly learn the bottom of the game really become very attractive candidates because they, they're showing true passion and they'll have an education beyond the only what we teach them. Um, following up to the only what we teach them in the school, are there anything are there anything, any, outside of the traditional education that you get, are there any supplemental programs or skills that you would recommend? And the answer might be no, you know, hard knocks to life. But are there any, any th programs, classes, um, additional educational continuing ed that you would recommend for your fields? I think what Scott just said is, is relevant because it's, it's not necessarily a course or something you can do, but inserting yourself into that culture, right? So if it's football, it's living football. If it's lifestyle product or basketball, it's living that culture. I think that, that just raises the level a little bit from my side. Okay. Yeah, whatever you can do to differentiate yourself, right? Don't come to ESPN and tell us that you're passionate about sports. There's 7,000 people who are passionate about sports in our company. So you want to have a skill set or something that is differentiating. You speak another language, maybe. Um, so, yeah, acquiring something that's a little bit uh, different than what you're necessarily focused on only adds to your value. And to that point, do something that's, that's really 
involved within whatever that industry is. You know, instead of going to an extra keg party or going to an extra fraternity party or sorority party, immerse yourself somehow, take that extra time to build not just something to put on your resume, but something when you're sitting there in an interview or your working job, you can bring real value because of an experience that you had within that particular industry. Now, networking is important, though. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. There's yeah. still something. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what's, um, what's a big mistake that you can make in your first job? What's, what's something that you can really... Thinking you know everything. Um, you know, everyone that's here is eager and smart and will probably do a great job. Um, but knowing as much, as smart as you are, as educated as you are, you don't know everything. You don't know the industry as well as the people that have been in the industry for 20 years. Um, and that's at least asking questions. I don't think there's anything wrong if you do not know an answer. I'd much rather someone that's working for me ask me than spend a week doing something the wrong way or not going down the right path. Um, and to me, it's also it's an intellectual curiosity. If people are just asking questions about the business, whether it's a specific um, project they're working on or just wanting to learn more about what's going on in the business, um, it's knowing that you don't know everything. And, and I think similarly, it's, it's you're not too good for something, right? There's no job too small, there's no job too big. I think we talked about that a little bit and that goes to entitlement, right? But there's people, my boss is still shredding shoes and mailing packages. There's no job that is too small. You have to do it. That's important. Yeah. That's really important. And a mistake from my first job? I, there's too many probably to <laughs> okay. pick just, I can pick my biggest mistake from last week probably. <laughs> um, the fact is you're gonna make mistakes. Right, whatever it is, and that's how we learn and grow, right? Mistakes are an opportunity to learn and grow. That's how you have to look at that. Yeah, and when you make a mistake, don't try to cover it up. Don't um, own it. learn humility early, because we're all gonna make mistakes. Again, uh, you make them in the entry level, and then when I was a general manager, I was still making mistakes, and learn humility, um, admit your mistakes, not just privately, but publicly, um, because I, I think it, it, it helps leadership. Um, I think one of the keys to, to limit the mistakes is something my father told me when I was younger, two eyes, two ears, one mouth, use them in the proper proportion. And generally, if you follow that, you have a very good chance of making fewer mistakes. But again, own your mistakes with, with true and genuine humility. I'll, I'll say this, I know there's people now who own mistakes, yeah, my bad. Well, not, my bad isn't good enough sometimes. You need to truly own it and try to work on it. And I'll say this, the biggest mistake, don't break the copy machine your first week on the job. <laughs> that, not that I, I mean, I knew someone that. You know. Asking for a friend. <laughs> um, this, um, this question, uh, I, I, I almost, want to say, if you need us to answer this for you, yikes. Um, when a possible hiring manager asks you why sports, what are some of the kind of answers you're looking for? That's got to be a personal reason, right? Right, that's I mean, my point, yeah. <laughs> you should know why you want to be in sports. It's got to be more than I just like sports, right? There's a reason, but I mean, specifically for the type of work I do, I could do it in almost any industry, right? I've done it in multiple industries. I wanted to work in an industry where the product was meaningful to me, where I wanted to go out and do extra, extra work because I wanted to be around the product more. Um, but everybody's answer is going to be slightly different and it's gotta be a personal reason. Yeah, right. yeah and, and I think we're asking the question when we interview people when you come to us, why sports? We're trying to find out from you why sports, truly why sports. Is it because you eventually want the platform for public adulation or you know, what is it? do you want to be a good teammate? Do you want to do something with a group of people to try to win a ring? Is it the, um, what is the reason that you're picking sports? I mean, you're asking that to us, but I think we ask that, we try to find that out from you too. 
Okay, Noel, um, when they finally do get to you, what skills do you find are lacking most? You know, what's, what's that missing piece? Uh, there's definitely some commonalities for candidates who don't interview well. Um, it's really not so much skills. Again, it's, it's the soft skills in, in, in many cases. Are they asking me questions? I want to be interviewed as much as I'm interviewing that person. I want to know that you're listening, that you're engaged in this conversation, you're following up on things that I've said, you've picked up on things that I've said. Uh, it's amazing to me how many people sit in front of me uh, to interview, and when we get done asking sort of the questions that I have, they don't have any questions back for me. That's, that's stunning. And then I, to your point, I want to see the intellectual curiosity. I want to see people that, that want to know more from me and more about the business. Um, you should be interviewing your interviewer uh, the whole time you're, it, you're in that office uh, looking for a job to make sure that, that our culture is the right fit for you as much as we're trying to figure out whether you're the right fit for our culture. Similarly, do you have, is there anything that you find hardest to find? Um, no, I mean, what he okay. said really covered it. The soft skills are, are the biggest thing. That's managing conflict, having patience to deal with people. It's, it's soft skills. Awesome. Through our interview process, I think the toughest thing we're finding, and we talked about this backstage, but I'm going to throw it out there. The toughest thing that we're finding or trying to um, get around is finding people that aren't entitled. We're finding a large number of people that are trying to join these leagues, and again, I think, um, or organizations, and um, it's um, finding unentitled people is a very difficult thing in this day and age. And we, we talk about it backstage, but I think it's an important thing to, to share with the audience. And, and I, I'm sure that, that there's a lot of eye rolls, because that's something I'm sure that, that you all hear a lot. But I will tell you that you know we're, we're kicking off day two here. That has been universal in the panel room. So do not hold that against these four panelists. That has been a universal theme in the, in the panel, panelists, the speaker room, all day yesterday, and on pretty much every panel call <laughs> throughout the, the last month of preparation. So do, do not hold that against these four people. Um, this question, Allison, Greg, um, there's been a lot of talk of uh, integrity in candidates. How do you assess it when you, when you interview, and does it really matter? Yes. <laughs> That's why there's a lot of talk about it. Um, I don't mean that it's, it's not like a checkbox where I can say, okay, you, you know how to do statistics, right? Like, it's, there's not a checkbox. It's, it's feeling that, y it's a feeling you get when you speak to someone, I think. I think it's you knowing, feeling like the conversation is, is a true, honest conversation, that you're being upfront with me. I know we talked about in the back room, like, you know, what's your greatest strength? What's your greatest weakness? It's not saying, oh, my greatest weakness is I work too hard, right? Like, that's not a, that's not integrity. <laughs> that's I not, care too much. Yeah, I care too much. I'm, I'm a perfectionist. Um, those, those aren't weaknesses in the sense that anyone's looking for. Um, so I think it's just feeling like the person I'm speaking with is being open and honest with me about what they're passionate about, what they are good at, what they know they need to improve on. And I think, to me, that gives me a sense of a really well-rounded candidate that also is very self-aware. Yeah. Same thing. It's the authenticity. It's, it's feeling like you're not feeding me a line of crap, basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> This, this is really, this is a tight question. I think we can all speak to it, though, because there's a question here. It says, the importance of tailoring sports analytics experience to a particular league. Strong NBA analysis report impresses NFL execs, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, I think in the work that I do, so we are like an internal consulting group for the 32 clubs, and we share a lot of best practices, and that's great within the NFL, but if someone can bring in knowledge from another league and say, well, the NBA does this really great, can we apply it here? That's knowledge, I haven't worked for the NBA, I don't know that, there's not a lot of people in my group that have worked in other leagues, and so if you can bring in that outside knowledge, I think, you know, it's not specific to analytics in that case, but 
I think if you can bring in knowledge of what other sports leagues, or other businesses in general, but certainly other sports leagues are doing, um, there's a lot of benefit that you can add um, and a lot of value you can add to our group specifically, for sure. And even, even if, so for me, like analytics isn't the most applicable thing for my role, right? But it's that mindset that you get from it. So if you can think analytically, you can approach a problem analytically. And it doesn't mean that you have to go through a set of data to get to that conclusion as long as you're following that thought process. OK. Yeah, let me do a quick shout out to Jeff Bennett, who's one of our vice presidents uh, uh, in our group at ESPN, who's recruited people like Dean Oliver and Ben Alomar and, and uh, Brian Burke to work in our analytics uh, mm. team. And uh, you know, the they all have their expertise, huh? The other Brian, the other Burke. Brian Burke, yes. Uh, they all have expertise in either basketball or football, but they also apply that analytics knowledge to multiple sports. We can't just have a whole bunch of people in our group that are experts in a single sport or single discipline. So that sort of multidiscipline or being able to apply your skills to multiple areas is, is critical for us. This is a great question because this is not an, an analytics, like this is not a um, equation. If you have previous sports experience, how many entry level positions slash years will you need before moving up? Depends how good you are. What? Right? I said it depends how good you are, right? You could stay in an entry level position for a long time if you're not doing the work. Well, not too long a time. Well, we, <laughs> well right, if you're not getting it's not a it. position, but you can. You could be hopping between entry level positions, <clears throat> but yeah, it depends on. And I, I think it's, it's not one size fits all because I've seen some really good people in different roles for whatever circumstance in life. Okay, it's not just professional. Some people have personal circumstances that cause them to have to be absent from their job, that they have to re enter in entry level jobs and I've seen some really good people because again, I think it comes back to as you're evaluating people, um, if you are humble enough and you have enough humility to move backwards in your career, to think about the future and or just be more concerned about being a part of the greater good, then I don't think there's a limit on it. But there's a point, I guess, some people don't get it but there's circumstances that cause people to go in different directions. Yeah, it's not formulaic. Um, that is time. I hope you got something functional out of this. <laughs>